Hey, everybody. Welcome to another podcast, another episode of Sustain Our Software. Here we talk about all about the topic of sustainability in regards to open source software. And we're so excited and we're very, very lucky to have with us a special guest. But first, I'll introduce the panel. Today, we have with us Pia Mancini. Hi, folks. And then I am here. I'm Eric Berry with uh, CodeFund. And today, our guest is Greg Bloom. Greg, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. So, Greg, you're the founder and chief organizing officer of the Open Referral Initiative. That's right. The instigator. The instigator. So, uh, before we get into that, tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your background and what led you to founding this, this initiative. Yeah. So, I'm calling from Miami Beach. I grew up here in Miami and recently moved back. My sort of professional career was usually always in some sort of nonprofit fundraising or communications. And sort of avocationally, I always found myself playing the role of a community organizer in one context or another. I, I just found, found myself drown, uh, drawn to the process of bringing people together, creating space for them to share information, build relationships, and build, build power and try to make change. And I came to the field of, let's say, human services, working for an organization called Bread for the City in the District of Columbia, and Bread for the City has a food pantry, a medical clinic, legal clinic, social workers. I went to Bread for the City on a tour. It was in my neighborhood. I was living in uh, the neighborhood of Bloomingdale in D.C. And I was really impressed to all kinds of services that were in the same building with very different professionals working together to treat people in need. You know, the lawyers were able to collaborate with the doctors and, and the medical clinic and, you know, the social workers were coordinating really complex kinds of care. And I got a job as the communications guy at Bread for the City, which was like a dream, right? I was able to, to learn about all the different kinds of work that we did and find the stories of the people we were helping and the professionals who were really trying to make a difference. And through that capacity, I also found myself sort of organizing spaces where people could get together and step out of their formal role of like, you know, professional or client and really just work together as peers, as neighbors, and talk about issues that, that we might be able to change by working together. And so there was a whole range of projects that came up during my time at Bread for the City. We organized a network of community gardens. We built a garden on our rooftop and we organized community wireless networks. And uh, we also worked on various community asset maps, community resource databases, and that's how I found the problem that I'm currently working on through Open Referral, which is what you might call like the community resource directory problem. And after years of many failed attempts at solving this problem, eventually we started a, a new approach to what turns out to be a pretty systemic uh, challenge in the health and human social, social services space. And, and really, this is like, I'm not a technical person. I'm not a data guy. It was the experience of uh, a decade of working with people with different kinds of skills and and life experiences that really gave me the the tool set I needed to to be able to step into a world that to some degree was kind of foreign, but try to be useful in it. So, How does Open Referral actually systematize basically being a good citizen and a good community member and relying on each other? How, how How does that come together? Well, so... Our realm, the, the, the realm of information that Open Referral is working with is information about any health, human, or social service available to people in need, really like any programs provided by a government or a nonprofit agency to try to help someone, could be childcare, uh, legal aid, food assistance, really anything. And the nature of this problem is, especially in the United States, I found, I found versions of this problem elsewhere, but it's especially pronounced here in the U.S., we sort of allocate resources collectively as a society really in an ad hoc way, right? Governments may or may not get funding. They sort of have priorities that come and go. They throw money out there. Uh, nonprofits, you know, try to get that money. They also get like philanthropy and charity. But, but ultimately, when, when these services that are, you know, intended to help people with pretty complex needs, when they're made available to the public, the providers of those services, government agencies, nonprofits, they don't really have strong incentives to actually get more people coming to them. It's not like, you know, a restaurant or, or, or a store that's selling goods where you, you want more customers. You know, oftentimes the demand far outstrips the supply for resources. And more importantly, the organizations, like they're not getting paid by the, per- the, by the people they serve. They're oftentimes not getting 
paid by their funder per person that they serve or not enough to cover their costs. So, you know, the information they put on their website might be like, here's how you donate to us and here's why you would donate to us, but not necessarily like, here's how you access our services. It's just not a priority for them to put that information out there. Oh, so yeah. this is super interesting. So it seems like super early on, you started working on this kind of problem of managing um, distributed common resources, right? Common exactly. resources that come from different places and there's no kind of centralized way of managing them because also like each each social social service is a world in its own right right exactly so. yeah and it's it's sort of provided ad hoc in many of these sectors it's it's like there aren't even governing entities you know that that set standards it's it's just sort of like money gets thrown out there organizations form to go get it and and then it's like n nobody really knows who's doing what they're like the irs doesn't collect They collect 990 forms from nonprofits, but the 990s might say like, like who's on your board and how much money you got. But it doesn't say like what you did, what you like, what you actually do, how people access those services. And I found this at Bread for the City, right? I was working at 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 this large organization with many departments and all these different services, and people would like send me emails saying, "Hey, we have this directory of of all the services in DC. Please come fill out this information." And I did it a few times and it would take me a couple hours, right? It's like a lot of different pieces of information I'd have to track down about like, is the food pantry only open on like Mondays and Thursdays for, for new clients, right? Like for, for intake, like that's a very specific piece of information that somebody might need to know. And even within the organization, it's hard to keep track. And eventually after I filled it out a couple of times on different websites, like taking hours of my time, somebody was like, you don't need to do that. Right. People just know people know to come to us, which is sort of true. Right. On a micro level, like people just knew to come to Bread for the City when you were in need. But at the macro level, we still don't have any canonical information about who does what. That's the root of this problem. And then what ends up happening on top of that root, right, what branches out of that is that many organizations then end up maintaining this information about who does what in these redundant competitive silos, right? So in any given community, you'll find half a dozen community resource directories maintained by organizations like Bread for the City had one internally. Others might have like long word documents. And, and usually you'll also have a couple of organizations who like make it their business to collect all this information and operate hotlines or websites where people can go find it. But they're all sort of collecting the same information in redundant Uh, duplication of each other, right? Redundant duplication. And it's really more than any one organization can sustain itself, this, this labor. And for a while, I thought this might not be a solvable problem, right? Like uh, after several times of trying to build a new website that would have all the information about all the resources available to people in need in DC and seeing how over the years those projects would either peter out or collapse in, in a ball of flame, or sometimes they would like turn into these like for-profit entities that then try to capture all this information, right? And, and extract as much money as possible. So over the years, you know, it, I've seen enough attempts to solve this problem that it, it started to seem like it was, it was not going to be tractable. I, I learned about the history of, of you know, there were, there were quite a few attempts actually in DC over the years, like every five years, uh, it seemed like someone had tried to build like the centralized repository of all of this information. Right. And it had never worked. And the people who were around who still remembered it, like barely wanted to talk about it because it had always been a traumatic experience where people had tried to build like the one monolithic system that was just like every organization would agree to use. And it, had, it just like it had ended in tears like several times. And I started hearing from other communities also that like, you know, the pattern of people seeing this problem and saying, okay, we need to build the one system that everyone will use. That just repeats itself everywhere and, and, and badly. But eventually I started talking with folks in the open data movement, such as, such as it was, uh, people working in open government, doing really interesting things. Like uh, Justin Grimes was one of the first people that really helped me think through open data Um, and, and what an API is, it took me years to really like wrap my head around it. And I still am not entirely sure if I understand, <laughs> but, uh, eventually we started developing a vision of like, okay, in a, in a perfect world, given that we know, you know, that 
that it seems like there's there's something that just doesn't work about like the centralized system. But we could hypothetically imagine a, a sort of distributed ecosystem in which you know this information that all these different organizations need to use in different ways, the same information could be shared among many different systems. Hmm. And open referral was eventually born with that vision in mind when all of a sudden the stars started to align and, you know, Code for America uh, built um, an open source app with an API for community resource information and schema.org published a standard for publishing information about services on the web. There were just a bunch of different things that happened over the course of 2012 and 2013 that I was watching that seemed to be components of that ideal best case distributed ecosystem solution, open standards and open source APIs and that sort of thing for this information. So in late 2013, I brought several of these different organizations together onto a conference call and said, hey, in principle, like, you know, the call centers and the websites and, you know, all these different systems, in principle, shouldn't they be able to share the same information? Shouldn't they be able to be interoperable? You know, on this conversation, you heard organizations that have previously sort of been competing with each other and not really talking to each other when they started recognizing that, yes, in principle, these should all work together, right? We all share the same goals of promoting information that can help people find resources. And, um, you know, there was a lot of skepticism on the call, but when people were hearing others saying, yes, in principle, like we would cooperate, hypothetically, the tone changed, right? When people heard that others were open to cooperation, they became open to cooperation, which I think is one of the most important insights when you're trying to figure out how do we design effective governance systems, right? Is that cooperation breeds its own logic. And that's how we started Open Referral was like, let's pursue this. Let's let's develop the the translation layers that can ensure that any information that might connect someone to information about any, any information system that might connect someone to programs that can help them or information about programs. It should all be able to speak the same language and they should be able to share the same data. And an open referral is an open network that's essentially pursuing that, that vision. We're about five years in. And as of late last year, the primary product that we put together, which was a data exchange specification for information about human services, uh, it was approved by the Alliance of Information and Referral Systems, which is it's, it's, uh, known as AIRS. It's the, the, the industry association for this whole field of health, human, and social service referral. And late last year, they said, you know what? These are now emerging industry standards. These are the default methods for exchanging information about health and human services. So that was, you know, the first of pretty much two primary goals that we that we set out to achieve. Um, it took us five years, but we got there. <laughs> so I'm going to give it another five more and see if we can uh, actually really fix this problem, which I, I genuinely believe would change the way we not only find and use services as you know as, as a society but even the way we allocate uh, resources to meet people's needs this is great it's like the, the the need for like a common taxonomy it can't be more important right and you know, when we when we were doing sustain remember like one of the first things we were thinking of was like hang on a second what exactly are we talking about when we say this or when we say yeah. something else or so, like the effort of building this common language, a common taxonomy for describe what we're talking about, seems like fundamental. And so, I'm really curious, like, how was your jump from, you know, a more kind of working on a on on a, on a more like data specific project and structure of data to, like, if you want, like a broader taxonomy um, that it seems to me is like what we we've been I've been seeing from your work in terms of how to define sustainability and management of the commons. Mm-hmm. And it's like that is the first, right? The first step is the same, right? It's defining these common categories, this common um, taxonomy. Yeah. So the work that I've been doing in Open Referral, one of the reasons that I suddenly was like, okay, you know what? This is a solvable problem. And, you know, I looked around for other people who might solve it before I jumped in, right? I did, I did not think that I was the right person. <laughs> to be trying to solve this problem. But eventually I just like, I talked to enough people and realized like there isn't anybody else. And like, and also everybody's just sort of like trying to figure it out. And so if I come in with a spirit of, of sort of inquiry and discovery, like, uh, you know, that I think that's, that's okay. Right. I don't need to be an expert in these fields. I just need to, 
know how to ask the right questions. But the reason I had the the chutzpah to even to even try that was I found the work of um, Eleanor Ostrom, uh, who won a Nobel Prize for studying uh, the commons and for her work called Governing the Commons, and learning about this whole field of research of essentially the many different ways in which communities figure out how to share resources. It's a whole field of study into, uh, unto itself. And to your point, it was like all of a sudden I had vocabulary for how people work together to solve collective action problems, right? Okay. I had, I, I had a, a whole library of pattern that these researchers have painstakingly documented across time and geography and culture different ways in which communities figure out how to solve collective action problems. And so with that vocabulary, it was like all of a sudden what had previously seemed intractable and collective action problems seem very intractable, especially to Americans, Mm -hmm. right? It's it's unique to our culture that we're just like, what are you going to do? There's nothing that can be done. Uh, you know, if everybody cooperated, it would all work out, but we don't live in a perfect world. So there's nothing to be done. So everybody should just be self-interested and greedy. It's um, like the proverbial free rider, right? <laughs> exactly. Right. And so, and, and it turns out like, actually there's, there's all kinds of ways in which people sustainably solve collective action problems and actually develop institutions that facilitate cooperation, right. That ensure cooperation in ways that still work for everybody, right? And, and, and once I had that language, I was able to come into this field and at least anticipate the nature of the dilemmas and imagine ways in which we could resolve those dilemmas or cope with them. And to your point about taxonomy, I think that's, that's an, impor- this is an important distinction. It's like some problems can be solved and some problems can only be coped with, right? And, but that's okay, right? Like you can still cope with a problem better or or worse. <laughs> you can cope with a problem very badly, or you can actually find ways that, that reduce the, the, the sort of wickedness of a problem, that mitigate the wickedness. And, you know, to your point, Pia, about, about taxonomies, it, and, and this is going to get a little bit into the weeds in the open referral world, but I'll, I'll give you a sense. There is a huge problem in the fields of health, human, and social services of categorization. Right? And that people use different words to describe the same services. You, you can have a different vocabulary from a funder to a manager of a service to a client actually looking for a service. Like they'll all use different words to describe the same service. Right? And that's a huge problem. And there are existing taxonomies. They're huge. Right? There's a taxonomy of, of health, human, and social services in the U.S. that is 14,000 terms long. That's 14,000 categories of health, human, and social services. And that's like that reflects decades of knowledge painstakingly gathered from the field that gets really precise about like what is this kind of service and who is it for but obviously that's not a very like usable category system for someone who just like needs a food pantry right (laughs) it's it's very user unfriendly to have such a controlled vocabulary and like there's not necessarily a solution to this problem right there's just ways that we we, we're not going to necessarily get everybody to agree on the same vocabulary but we can design systems that cope with that complexity that enable us to have different vocabularies that coexist and can be translated into and out of each other like more effectively than they currently are. And so open referral doesn't necessarily come into this being like, we have the solution, we're going to do it this way, and then the problem will be solved. We sort of assume that there are solutions out there that we can find by working together, by testing assumptions, by scaling up what we find to work in some places when that is possible, but also by you know remaining humble and understanding that like some of these problems are just not necessarily um, technically solvable, and they're they're things that we should just work together to deal with over time. Except I have my my professor of public policy at university always used to say that the person that defines a problem is the person that decides the solution. And that always stuck, right? Like the person who's able to frame a problem, like framing a problem, finding a problem immediately frames and defines the type of solution, right? So that's only to stress how, how important I think it is, like what you're doing, right? Because defining what a problem looks like and building those categories and, and that common language is also it's the first step towards designing a solution and it impacts great things yep. that you can think of. And if there is a solution, right, to your point. Yep. 
So how would you how would you define you know the problem of the commons? Do you want to like take a step back there and maybe yeah. walk us through a little bit of of that? Well, so what's the commons? Like how would you define it? What are the main? Um, yeah. yeah. Why why do we need to I guess manage it? Right. Yeah, it's a really important conversation to have because I think especially over the last 10 years in these communities that are probably listening to this podcast, the concept of the comments suddenly became like really in vogue, right? After Wikipedia and Linux and you know, Yochai Benkler's work on commons-based peer production, suddenly what, what, what had been a term that I think was really unfamiliar uh, maybe a couple of decades ago, especially in the U.S., became, you know, suddenly like really hot topic. Um, and I think it's oftentimes the concept is sort of abused. It's thrown out there without, without really a care uh, for, for what a commons actually is. So, so, so yes, let's, let's sort of dig in. The simplest way of, of saying like, what is the commons is, is just resources that we share, right? And, you know, the air is a commons and language is a commons. And many, you know, really specific natural resource systems. Uh, like I'm right now looking out on Biscayne Bay in Miami, and it's, you know, many different people are sharing this bay for and doing many different things in it. And when people share things, they come up with they come up against dilemmas, right? You know, there are different incentives and different interests and different perspectives on how a, a resource should be shared, and that resource might be vulnerable to overuse, to misuse. And so, you know, the, the commons, is, it's a fraught uh, site. It's a site of struggle, um, any, any given commons. Yeah. And historically, the, the 20th century political regime and, you know, the 20th century economics in particular, unfortunately, was premised largely on a misconception of the commons. The most, I think it's, in, I think it's an article in, in Science. Um, the journal science. So the tragedy of the commons is, I think, the journal of science is like most popularly cited essay mm-hmm. from the '60s, written by a guy named Garrett Hardin. And this is definitely something I learned about in like my freshman year public policy 101 class. Right? It was like one of the first classes we learned about the tragedy of the commons, which is essentially this notion that if you have, let's say, a pasture growing grass and Anybody can go onto the pasture. This guy, Garrett Hardin, wrote this essay being like, well, what will inevitably happen is everybody's going to bring as many cows as they can to the pasture to feed their cows. Their cows get fat and they get milk, right? And each person benefits, like every farmer who brings an additional cow, like gets a real clear benefit from having another cow that can eat the grass on the pasture. But they don't pay the cost. They don't pay the cost of all the cows eating the pasture and the pasture eventually will collapse. And Hardin's whole essay is like, this is inevitable. And like, you, there's nothing, can, nothing can be done to avoid it. Um, you can only have the government pass a law to prevent people from going on the pasture at all, or somebody should own the pasture. And they are like, they're the only ones who can bring the cows on the field because they'll know, you know, how many cows can be on this field before it gets, you know, entirely eaten up and it collapses. And so this was sort of like, a somewhat glib essay. And actually, if you read the essay, it's a, it's a horrifying essay because he's actually advocating for uh, essentially like forced abortion and sterilization. He's really worried about open population, uh, overpopulation. And mm-hmm. the real objective of the tragedy of the commons essay is, is to like, his political agenda is like, poor people should be sterilized. Oh <laughs> right? Yeah, because, because, because he's saying like, look, like they're going to con- his angle is like people will continue to breed and will destroy the earth. And so as a result, we should like, we should force sterilization of people. That's the message of the tragedy of the commons. And you know, that, that grim part gets sort of like left out of the popular cliche. Um, mm-hmm. But still today, most Americans assume that you can't share resources. It's not possible. And Ostrom, Eleanor Ostrom working with uh, her husband, Vincent over decades, Vincent Ostrom was, he was a scholar of local governance, right? One of the first people to actually be like, you know what? All history is like usually done of the studies of like, of, of the leaders of nations, but it's actually local government where so much politics that actually impacts people and impacts the world happens and nobody's studying it. So Vincent Ostrom was studying local government and Eleanor Ostrom was, was his grad student and he had her studying reservoirs across California to see which communities 
figured out how to protect their water, right? What were the characteristics of a community that would, that would, that would not just drink all of its water up or send it all into the farms and deplete the reservoir? And from that study of comparative analysis across communities to figure out like which communities succeeded at preserving their water, at sustaining, at sustaining their rev- reservoir, they developed the initial framework that eventually became what's known as the institutional analysis and design framework that they drew from thousands of case studies of resource sharing systems. Mm. And governing the commons was a Nobel Prize winning book. She won a Nobel Prize in economics, I think, in 2009. Uh, and she was not an economist. So this is the first time a non-economist had won a book on, on economics. I'm mm-hmm. uh, sorry, won a Nobel Prize on, on, in economics. And, um, but she was essentially studying the political economy of institutions that have to figure out how to share resources. And she observed this whole set of patterns from which she drew principles, design principles. And Pia, this is how you and I met, was I had been learning about this framework in the context of like community gardens and community wireless networks and, and trying to figure out why I saw so many well-intentioned projects popping up and only to fail, right? Only to not quite realize the potential of their vision of like an open network and a beloved community. And I was trying to figure out, you know, what, what might prevent failure? And this framework was so, it was so interesting because when you actually see it written out, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, of course, Right. And also it's like, you know, it's basically a, it's not a blueprint, right? It doesn't tell you what to do. (laughs) What I find really inspiring about um, the principles is that like it kind of puts forward this idea that our our commons is not bound to be tragic. We can actually manage it. And, you know, that is refreshing and inspirational. And and, and I, I think it's right. I think communities around the world have been managing their commons successfully it's just the narrative of the free riding and tragedy of the commons seems to have, um, right. I don't know, been the prevailing narrative. But the principles are also like famously difficult to read, right? So, yeah. Uh, and to, yeah, they're, jar- they're jargony. <laughs> exactly, to digest. So, I, do you want to tell us a little bit about like the work that you've been doing to kind of translate this or how you're thinking about it? Or it seems like a lot of your work has to do with also making information accessible. That's that's part of your work with open referral, I guess, and, and, and with structuring data in a way that it's digestible, not only by APIs, but also by the larger kind of an, um, audience or, or publics of this that can use this data. So are you, have you been working on kind of bringing them down to to a more understandable set or how are you thinking about that? Yeah, so, you know, I've been thinking about this for, for a while and, and the Sustain OSS conference was one of, an, it was, an, I guess the first one was 2017 maybe. The one in San Francisco uh, was the first uh, first I went to. And I definitely came into that conference being like, okay, I've just been learning all about Ostrom for a few years and, and, and uh, about these principles. Seems pretty relevant to me. I've been thinking about it a lot, but you know, it was only during the course of that Sustain conference when I was listening to open source software maintainers, right? And infrastructure maintainers talking about their challenges that I was like, this actually seems really relevant here as well. And it also seems like something that folks hadn't really encountered, right? I think generally speaking, people had encountered Yohai Bankler's concepts of the wealth of networks and common-based peer production, but definitely in the world of open source software, and not just there, also in the world of open source hardware, right? Like somewhat anarchist hacker spaces and, and sort of like activist spaces on the left that have some sense of like how the commons are good and open things are inherently good. I've actually observed that they struggle with a lot of dilemmas that you could expect if you're someone who really thinks that commons are inherently tragic, right? (laughs) You know, there's a lot of examples of of tragic commons in the open source world uh, Mm -hmm. that I think people are finally starting to grapple with. And it's interesting because what I found was in some ways, the culture of these spaces, the notion of like, we should have open networks, even the, the, the most ideal, idealistic folks, right, who just really believe in openness as an ethos and free software and so on, end up grappling with dilemmas that they might not be prepared for, especially if you don't have this, this framework for how you approach those dilemmas. Like, and, and I'll give you an example, like the first, the first principle of the 
institutional analysis and design framework that Ostrom developed in Governing the Commons is essentially boundaries, right? That a resource needs clearly defined boundaries around it, right? And you need to be able to effectively exclude parties that, that don't have claims to that resource, right? You need boundaries around the resource and you need boundaries around the group of people who can access a resource. This is like the first principle of resource management. Which is something and super hard to do in open source because the artifact, exactly. it's open and right. And, and, exactly. and the, you, you know, the object of our creativity, it's the yep. thing that gets shared. It's interesting, right? It's like the, the, the mar it's true. The, the, the marginal cost of one new person using as open software, it's zero for the, for the artifact right. itself. Right. But the community, yep. You know, it has an impact on the community, but it's not the community what's being shared. So the community was the right. common. It's the so it's, it's yeah, it's a fascinating problem. Sorry. <laughs> no, yeah, it's, it's, you're totally right. I mean, it's, it is interesting because I think part of the reason the common suddenly became in vogue as a concept was this notion of like, oh, those problems that natural resource systems have, we don't have with digital goods, right? Because Because anybody can use it and it doesn't get depleted, right? right? And so the technical term for that is non-rivalrous and non-exhaustive, right? Is like, you know, a, a, a pasture, only so many cows can be on the pasture at so many uh, at a given time. And, and you know, and, and if you eat too much of the grass, the grass won't come back, right? Those are, those are depletable resources. And when it comes to digital goods, you don't have that problem. In fact, you, you might have the other problem of, like, if nobody uses it, it's not valuable, right? It's so only valuable if boundaries? people use it. How do you set boundaries yeah. in such a system? So in Open Referral, we set boundaries uh, around the scope and around the values and principles. And this was something that came instinctively to me as, as an organizer, at least the values and principles part and the scope I've learned from watching communities of software developers where we said, okay, here is the specific problem that we're going to work on, right? And we're defining away like all kinds of other related problems that we're just declaring out of scope. And here's the, the values and the principles that we bring to this, right? In, in Open Referral's case, the values are accessibility and interoperability, um, reliability, and sustainability. And I got those values from talking with dozens of people over the years who do this work talking with them about with them about like what do you want in the world right what do you want to see happen what would be good and those are the words that like kept coming up of like we need to be able to sustain this work we need it to be reliable obviously and all these technologies should work together and it was through articulating those values that we said okay here's what's in this space that is open referral and if anything comes out comes up from our work that might actually not meet one of these criteria we now have a frame of reference to be able to say actually that's not that's not within our boundaries, right? That's not something that we're going to work on. It's not something we're going to even potentially allow. So open referrals, like an open network, anybody can join. But if somebody comes in and starts using our tools in ways that might, might actually make it harder to interoperate, right? Or in ways that are, are potentially going to develop information systems that are not reliable. I, I, I as, as like the benevolent dictator of the frame, to your point earlier, right? Like I can, I have at least the power to be able to say, This is how we are framing this problem. You know, I'm, I'm able to invoke those values and, those, and print our principles to guide the discussion about what should be done, right? And I think there are, you know, th these are complex issues. There are probably other potential answers about like, well, how would you set boundaries about this particular resource or that particular resource? But r realizing that we can actually apply these principles in how we think about stuff and how we talk about stuff in ways that mimic how you might apply these principles in terms of like setting up a fence, right? Around a pasture, right? <laughs> or, or developing like a monitoring system to, to see like how many cows are on the pasture, right? Like they, these are different resources than physical resources, natural resources, but the ideas are actually, are, are actually pretty applicable, right? The basic premise of like, well, here's how you would design a safe and sustainable community You have to be able to apply these principles in ways that are unique to the particular resource, but it, is, it does give you a guide, right? It does give you an, an, a, and a pattern like.
essentially that you can use. I was thinking while you were talking about, you, you know, have you, have you seen examples or what do you think about if we are unable to put a boundary on the actual artifact, on, 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 on the product of our work, of our creativity, mm -hmm. can we put a boundary on our involvement in it? Or to say it in another way, like if we cannot close the source code, can we close mm -hmm. access to maintainer's time, right? If you cannot, right, if, if, if we want to, you know, if you have an open source and you share that with the world and you give that to the world, can you put those boundaries in your community, right, in your own time, yep. the access that others have to, to you as the source of that creativity? Yeah, I mean, I think I've definitely seen plenty of examples where well-intentioned communities go awry because I, I think they haven't done that conceptual framing, right? That conceptual fencing of like, what is this really for? And like, I've been in a lot of these like civic hacking meetup groups, right? Where you have people who are like trying to like code for their, for their city, right? And I've seen projects come out of those groups, for example, that are like quite obviously what I would call like gentrification intensifier projects, right? <laughs> Where like, this is supposedly like for a place, but who's really going to use this tool, right? For example, in, in DC, people built like, uh, built a tool to, sh to analyze data about like where different students at any given school are coming from, right? So any given school, it's like, I can now see where, where this, which neighborhoods the students at the school are coming from. It was a cool data visualization. It looked awesome. And then they built a tool to be like, okay, now I, I like the tool visualized zoning proposal changes and allowed you as, as a user to like submit your feedback about where you want your school to be zoned, right? Mm -hmm. And these tools used together were incredibly powerful for anybody who knew how to use them <laughs> to be able to, to essentially give feedback about how you want your neighborhood and, and the surrounding neighborhoods and the schools to be zoned. And the folks who built them were really excited that like thousands of people used them. Like if, if and like tens of thousands, like, and it's like, oh, wow, this is like, this is having a real impact. People are using it. If people are using it, that must be good. But nobody had done that conceptual framework to think through like, who's really going to be using it? Is it anybody? Is this just open for anybody to use? Or is it like, like and if so, like who's practically using it? The ones who are practically using those tools were the friends and professional networks of these civic hackers, quote unquote, who were almost entirely folks who did not come from the city, who were fueling gentrification of the city, right? And a city that's like experiencing the serious racial antagonism, understandably, from communities that are actively being pushed out of, you know, nice neighborhoods, of good school districts. And this like, this tool that's supposedly civic was quite clearly accelerating that process of gentrification, right? Of increasing power among those who already had power and removing choice and agency from those who, who did not have power, who didn't know to even look for like these slick new apps that could give them voice in the school districting process. But because that organization hadn't done that work of setting their boundaries, of saying like, what is it we mean when we say we code for this city, right? What are our principles? How do we know whether this is good or not? There was no way for me who had, like, I had concerns and somebody was like, well, this is an open network. What are you going to do? Right. <laughs> right? Like, you can't stop them from doing this. And it's true. We had no, we had no tools to be able to say, actually, this doesn't accord with our principles. It doesn't accord with our purpose. So it's not something we're going to support. Right. They might be, even if we did have those tools, that, like those people who built those tools might be, might be, even if we did have that boundary set they could still be free to go build their app somewhere else, but you wouldn't have the situation where a group, a community was, was designed for some given purpose. And now its purpose is being diluted or even perverted, right? Which impacts the long-term sustainability of that group. And by, by being able to set those boundaries around, like when we say we're, we're doing good in the world, here's how we know what is good, hmm. right? Here's how we know what falls in, into that concept if you don't if you don't do that, then you don't know what falls out of it either. And and you lack the ability to actually make decisions as a community. 
which is one of the key questions about like, is this community going to be able to survive? Is, right. is it prepared to make difficult decisions? Which is really, it's really tough, especially for open source, in, open, in most open source communities, I would say that they might just be folks together that come together for building a software or technology. And those conversations are really, really hard to, um, yep. to come, right? And, and especially when you don't meet each other face to face. And so, yeah, it's, um, huh, I wonder if there's like a, a space there for, for sustain or, or for someone else to kind of help projects go through how to talk about these issues, right? So um, anyway, food for thought. But Greg, do you want to um, walk us through kind of other, the other principles and maybe how, yeah. how you're thinking about them in the context of open source governance and sustainability? Yeah. Well, and to, to the point you just made, you know, a, after two of these sustain conferences that we went to, at the second one, I came ready to be like, actually, this is a framework that we should wrap our head around, right? The first one, I was like, I, I mentioned Ostrom, I mentioned the design framework. We had a couple of great sessions that sort of explored it. And then in the second one, we came in and said, actually, let's, let's develop versions of these principles that will resonate with these communities. And I didn't necessarily have the answer. And I think we made some good progress. We have not yet finished. So this is like, this is a valuable conversation to be having in this particular context because it did seem to resonate with folks when we put them on the wall and sort of, uh, and, and aligned like the stories that we'd heard from people who were struggling to sustain their open source communities. You could see that some adaptation is needed, right? some new language, some new vocabulary is needed, but, but the, the basic framework seems to apply. So yeah, we can walk through these, uh, and we have some documentation that could be shared afterwards. I'll sort of walk through the the simple version that's in my head mm -hmm. without reading out the jargony version that's from Ostrom's work. Um, That'd be great. <laughs> uh, yeah, so because it took me uh, probably a solid year of rereading these things over and over again before it eventually clicked, and I was like, oh, okay, it's not just jargony words now. It's like this is a whole logical framework. So principle number one is. Boundaries. If you want to share a resource and protect it, you need boundaries. Boundaries around the resource and boundaries around who, who has the right to use the resource, right? Principle number two is rules. And that seems obvious, right? But rules that are specifically appropriate for the particular resource and the particular people who are using the resource, right? So there aren't a specific set of rules. Like the principle is just like, you should have rules. <laughs> and that is sort of quickly followed by the third principle is that, well, the jargony version is resource appropriators have the ability to participate in the process of making rules. The members of this community have some way of shaping those rules. Right. The next principle from there, everything, everything sort of like slows downwards from this. The next and principle is, is, are, are is monitoring. To, so in, in, the, in the context of open source, like, rules, I just want to make the point and, and just validate this with you, are not just licenses, right? It doesn't have to do only with the consumption of the product that we generate, but also the production. Yep. Side, right? Yeah, I mean, licenses are a good one. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's a great example of like a specific rule that's, that's set. And other rules could be like, you know, what's the, you know, here's how this kind of information is shared. Here's how this kind of decision is made. Here are the, the criteria for evaluating these decisions. You know, a certain amount of time frame between, like, let's say uh, an open source project is going through a process of versioning. Presumably, there should be set expectations, if not explicit policies, for how much time is, you know, is allowed for people to comment, for what happens if people disagree, for, you know, guidelines for, you know, what happens if, if a new version has a breaking change, you know, those, those are all essentially policies. And maybe in some, in some communities, they're sort of like ad hoc, yeah. right? They might, they might just be decided on the spot. And as a community scales, as a resource grows more complex, the ability to go from essentially norms, right? Before you have rules, you presumably have norms that are like, this is just how we do things. And we're able to, you know, we have trusting relationship and expectations, but like you start developing rules when the scale of your set of social relationships and the, and the scale of the resource is too great to really just be managed through norms alone. Right. Yeah. And 
And this, this framework says it's not just that you should have rules, but those rules should be a living set of agreements over, that, that can change over time. And the people who are using this resource, whose, whose livelihood depend on it um, in some way, they should be able to participate in the setting of those rules. That doesn't necessarily mean every rule should be done by consensus. It doesn't prescribe, like, here's the right way to make rules. It's simply saying, as a principle, <laughs> you, should, you should figure this out. Yeah. And yes, from there, it's like, once you have rules and a process of setting rules, you should have some ability to monitor people's behavior. Are they abiding by the rules? Is this working? And you should be able to share that information back with the members of this of this institution, of this arrangement, right? They should be able to get the fruits of that monitoring so that they know what's going on. You should have sanctions, right? If rules are broken, you should have some means of recourse. And you should also have conflict resolution, right? You need to be able to like potentially push someone out, but that person needs to be able to like say, hey, here's my case, right? Like there, ne- there should be some, some means in any given community at any meaningful scale of resolving conflict. And those means also should be affordable to the people who participate in them, right? It's, it's of no use to have a conflict, conflict resolution mechanism that is too costly or too time intensive for people to go through that sort of defeats the purpose potentially. And then the, the last two principles are, are sort of meta. In Ostrom's context, you know, when she's writing about natural resource systems, she observes that like one of the important things about a community's ability to share its resource, right? Let's say it's a river or a coastal area or a forest is like the government needs to grant them permission to do that management itself, right? The government needs to recognize their autonomy to be able to do this work of governing themselves. And that principle, we were sort of open in terms of like, how does this apply to Mm open source communities, right? Like, it's not necessarily clear to me that this is really, like, that this principle in an open source community is a question of, like, does the government allow us to develop open source software, right? That's a little bit, you know, it's a digital resource. People, you know, we have freedom of speech. (laughs) We can make whatever software we want. But it may be that, you know, within an open source community, there should be provisions for people to be able to, like, fork, right? Or to be able, people to be able to, uh, make their own branches and submit pull requests. Uh, you know, the ability for people to essentially govern themselves within a community is, I think, the question that we didn't quite uh, arrive on, like, a version of this principle that applies to open source yet. And likewise, the very last principle is is subsidiarity or nestedness. And I think this is super important to, for to, under, to cope with the complexity of this whole concept is, like, Resource systems operate at different levels, right? Like in, a, in the natural world, let's say your resource system is like, let's say water is your resource, right? And you're in a city that like has a limited amount of water. Well, there's the reservoir, there's the river, the river, there's the the watershed, right? There's there's all these different components of the whole system that is the water system, and People living near the reservoir, the organizations, the, the, the entities that can draw water from the reservoir have a different set of issues than the people living along the river, the people living at the mouth of the river, right? Like they should all be able to govern those different parts of this big complex resource and they should be also in communication with each other, right? Mm-hmm. So this principle is sort of called polycentricity, which is you know, you, you have different decisions are being made at different scales in different places, and they are in a governance conversation with each other, right? It's not necessarily a hierarchical structure. It's not, it could be um, in some ways, but the idea is, is that, you know, complex systems should have enough autonomy so that people who are interested in different parts of it are able to make decisions locally. And that seems to be a principle that is I find in thriving open source communities, you can see that principle in play, right? You can, you can see that there are, even if it's not so formal, even if there aren't like elaborate constitutions or rule systems, you, there, there are ways that people sort of like make decisions at the level that's relevant to them and that's respected at higher levels and in dialogue with those higher levels. This is like super important in the open referral world where we have like, you know, our resources data about services, 
but open referral has developed a data specification, right? And that's used by local organizations. So we're governing the decisions made about this data specification, this common language, this common vocabulary, but we're not making decisions at that level about how people should manage their data at a local level, right? They make those decisions. They use our data specification. They might be able to adapt. They might want to adapt that data specification. They might want to add a field or turn a field into a table to accommodate the local specificity of a particular issue in their particular sector, they're free to make that decision, right? Because they they can more effectively make that decision in a way that works for them than we can anticipate all the potential idiosyncratic local issues, right? And so it's much more effective to have a governance model that enables different decisions to be made about different relating resources at different scales in ways that can still dialogue with each other, inform each other, um, and evolve together. So Greg, I got a question. The concepts that we've talked about are fantastic. And you worked for five years and the work that you've done with open referrals finally become a standard. Do you see that standard? Do you see the same challenge and hurdles in front of us for in the open source communities that we that this also has to become adopted and become a standard? And if so, what is required to get it to that point? Do you mean applying these principles to the open source community in general? Correct. Yeah. I mean, I think there, there's definitely some cultural mismatch, right? <laughs> what I have found, um, uh, especially before I found the people who came to the sustain community, what I found in the open source software world was, you know, everybody was super familiar with the essay of like the cathedral versus the bazaar. And people took that bizarre part really seriously. And they're like, yeah, this is just like anything goes, (laughs) right? Anybody does whatever they want. It's, you know, we live in a meritocracy. If people make good code, then others will use that code. And, you know, if somebody doesn't like the way that the person who originally made the code is behaving, they can fork the code and just go do whatever they want, right? And this is, this is the, the sort of, that sort of open ethos. And I admire some aspects of that, and I admire the sort of anarchist bent to that. I'm drawn to it. And I also think it doesn't really make for healthy institutions, right? And I, and I think, I think the, the sustained conversations emerged from perhaps an overdue recognition of the fact that that ethos of just anybody should do whatever they want and the good stuff will rise to the top and it'll be, you know, it'll be this great sort of marketplace of ideas and code that's t- totally open. It doesn't end up uh, preparing these networks for the dilemmas that come from success. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think a lot of people came in to sustain ready to think about monetization of open source this or open source that. Like, how do we monetize it? And a bunch of other folks were there being like, well, you know, we figured that out and then we had our real problems, <laughs> right? Once we started monetizing this, then we had to figure out what to do with it and how to, how to make those decisions. And, and so it, it seemed finally like, like there was this, awareness that it's not enough to just leave it at this notion that we have open networks and here comes everybody and it'll all work itself out. Like we are going to have to prepare ourselves to make decisions. And that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, there should be coding done by committee, right? But I don't necessarily have a, a, a prescription. And this reflects Ostrom's own approach, right? Eleanor Ostrom, it drives me nuts, but like, she refuses to make prescriptions for what should be done. She merely sort of describes like these are patterns of success and failure, but it's it's not a blueprint for how to how to do this in your in your community. And I think that's very true here. We don't necessarily have answers for um, specifically how should any given open source community run. But I do think a broader awareness of these principles and and a, a practice of applying them, right? A practice of saying like if you're starting a community, what are the questions? that you should answer. Or if your community is going through growing pain, what are the questions that you should ask, right? In order to find better answers than just hoping everything's gonna work out, right? And hoping everybody will do their best. By asking the right questions, you might actually lead yourself to appropriate answers for your given community at that given point in time. Of course, the maddening part of this process is, as time goes on, you might need to ask new questions and find new answers, right? Like this is a, these are, these are dilemmas with which we can at best cope. But yes, I've been working with some of the um, folks that I met at Sustain, including Benjamin Nichols, 
and, and a few others uh, to, to take our notes from those conferences and, and try to pull out a common set of principles, or at least questions, that potentially characterize the search for good governance and good institutional design for open source communities. This is an, a new project, or at least, let's you know, this is not a new conversation, but we are talking about potentially like bringing these principles onto a, uh, into a forum and, and sort of revising them and then collecting examples of, gov- of governance models that, that reflect them. And uh, it's work I'm certainly interested in, even though I, I really can't claim to be an expert in. It's just like, I found the process of asking these questions to be pretty rewarding. And if I can find others who, who want to who wanna pursue that path as well, um, I, would, I would be glad for the company on these journeys. Greg, where should people go to find you? Like if people want to contribute to this, to the framework, do you have anything online? How are you going about that process? So I'm at Gregish, G-R-E-G-G-I-S-H, uh, on, on Twitter and, and also on GitHub. We've been having, to some extent, these, com- these conversations in the Sustain OSS forum. So I, I would point folks there. You know, I think there's a governance group, and, and I shared the notes from the last conversation, and that's a, that's a live document, and folks have been commenting on it. So, so yeah, you can look there for our conversations about, about these governance principles. And I'm interested to see where this goes, and a few folks have said, you know, they, they, they want to see this um, turn into a more active discussion, maybe something we bring out of that, that forum and onto a site. And, Pia, I was hoping to ask you, you know, is, is, is there going to be another sustain uh, OSS workshop on the, on the horizon? Million dollar question. We want to do another one. I think we're a bit late for this year, but we had a proposal. We have a proposal that we're going to put out to the community in the coming days about the coming sustains. And also we've been talking to Gunner about governance in the context of the rising corporate funding to open source mm. and the kind of renewed or extra or, you know, um, challenges on steroids that it's bringing and so like having maybe a virtual hangout conversation about it so stay tuned yeah. and also while you were talking i was thinking so one of the challenges we had on open collective at the beginning was that members of communities were unsure what they could expense to their communities and so one of the things that we opened on the platform that i think was kind of quite helpful was a uh, um, expense policy, right? And so each collective has their own expense policy and they say, okay, this, it's, it's okay to expense these things to the community. It's not okay to do this or these are the steps. Okay. And so I was remembering about, like I was thinking about it in the context of your, what you were mentioning about rules. I'm thinking mm, maybe there's something that we can actually bake in Open Collective that it's common to all open source projects. So in the same way that every yep. project has a readme on GitHub, maybe all projects can have kind of a, you know, a bigger version of the expense policy or something. You know, these are the rules of our community. And even if it's just yep. a space to have it, I think it might force a lot of people. It's going to be like a forcing function for folks to think about those rules, right? Because we are just saying, Okay, you don't have to use it if you don't want, but this is the space for your rule, yep. right? So at least putting that forward baked into the the software itself might be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I don't think that I suspect that there are not a standard set of rules, right? Yeah. Um, that right. is not what I found in this literature. You know that that where it's like yeah. here's how to do it, right? But there could be a standard set of questions. Yeah, exactly. Right? That folks. Exactly. Yeah, a standard set of questions that folks who are like starting an open collective account or, you know, or page for their community, mm-hmm. you know, those are prompts that might get them thinking. Um, yeah. And if you give the right set of prompts and, and then maybe some examples, that, that, that might be the best hope we have <laughs> to nudge folks in the direction of thinking through some of these, some of these governance issues. I love so. that idea. Let's do it. Let's let's come together. Yeah. Like if, if the kind of if the working group on on the governance um for um track on the forum or who's thinking about this and, and you and Ben and I'm happy to to put in my two cents. But we can come up with those questions. Um, I'd love to sort of take that home and do um our homework and build that into Open Collective, right? Because um, yeah. I, I I absolutely believe in in this idea of having standards and. Sometimes it's just about that 
prodding, right? It's like, hey, this, these are the questions or this is the space where you can post. And, and I saw it happening with expense policy. So, yeah. Anyway, yep. let's do it. Absolutely. Well, first of all, you mentioned, you mentioned Gunnar uh, and he did a great job facilitating these events and i just want to give him a shout out and aspiration uh his organization a shout out there i would not have made it this far without their help and uh they were absolutely essential they, the aspiration is actually our fiscal sponsor for open okay. referral they're the first ones i go to when when i have a, a tricky problem with a lot of different stakeholders and we have to think through like how do we facilitate this conversation um and i just want to shout them out to anybody who's listening who might be struggling with a governance issue of your own when it comes to open source software that has any kind of like social purpose, they're great folks to talk to, to think about how do you design a dialogue among folks who could be cooperating more effectively? I mean, how do you do that in a way that's, that's joyful, that generates energy, that doesn't suck, suck the life out of everybody involved. So I just want to give a shout out to aspiration for that. And you also mentioned homework. There are some good texts. There are some good, sources of research that specifically apply Ostrom's framework to digital resources. So I would, I would suggest if folks want to learn more on this, there is a book called Governing Knowledge Commons. It's an anthology of essays, and it's building off of one of Ostrom's later works, uh, Knowledge as a Commons, Understanding Knowledge as a Commons. And so you can start actually digging into reflections on how information communities and, and even open source code uh, communities succeed or fail at governing themselves at protecting their resources. And in fact, there's even a, a compilation of case studies on open source communities done by Charlie Schweik. And so I'm, I'm sure I'll share some links uh, so folks can follow up afterwards uh, if they want to learn more about that existing literature. Fantastic. Eric? All right. Well, I, uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. I was a little nervous coming in because I haven't been too aware of the uh, the issues surrounding governance. I focus a lot more on the um, on the funding side, as you mentioned, and I hadn't realized how how much more to the picture there is. So we really appreciate you coming on this podcast. To wrap up, one of the things that we do every week is we uh, choose we do something called picks, and each one of us has one to you know one to three things that we really enjoy that we've something that makes us us, and we like to share that. And I'll go ahead and start. There's a couple of things I want to share. The first one I want to share is is a comic book. Now, I'm I'm not a big comic book reader, but there is one comic book that I remember reading about. 10 years ago, and uh, it's a big, long series called Preacher. Preacher's uh, written by a guy named Garth Ennis, and it's fantastic writing. It's, a, it's a, an incredible, incredible uh, story, and they've actually turned it into a show on Hulu. So I started watching it on Hulu, and I'm like, oh, I got to go back and read these again. So mm-hmm. recently, my wife was on vacation. I spent the whole time, I read all 66 comics, and, um, and now I'm all caught up, but Fantastic, uh, fantastic comic. The other one I got to say is um, my iPad Pro. Now, I'm, I'm one of those geeks that went out and spent a lot of money and got that iPad, really fancy one with all the, all of the goodies. And I'm constantly fascinated on how thin it is, how beautiful it is, how, how much it's become a part of my daily, my daily uh, operations. And also now that the new iPad OS is coming out, I'll be able to actually work on it and do development on it as well. So very exciting. So those are my two picks. Pia, how about you? <laughs> I forget about this part, so I have to improvise really quickly. So what I normally do is I share the book that I'm reading at the moment. So and it is a good book and it's um it, and I can recommend. And in this case I can. And the, this is the age of surveillance capitalism. Oh. Uh, by Shoshana Saboff. It's it's a fascinating, it's a break. So it's super heavy. So if you need to, you know, if you're going to take it around, I recommend reading it in your Kindle or um, device of choice because it's like a serious chunk of book. But it's, um, yeah, it's fascinating. It's the age of surveillance capitalism, the fight for a human future at the new frontier of power. So recommend that. And the other thing that I read recently, and I'll have to find the name, is The Value of Everything. The author is Mariana Mazzucato, The Value of Everything, Making and Taking in the Global Economy. It's a story about how we think about value, how different things became part of how we create value. Like, for example, the financial system 
the financial system wasn't inside the boundaries of what was actual value of the economy. It became at one point and the impact of that. So it's a fascinating read and it has um, some interesting insights about for kind of the whole open source economics space. Cool. So I guess that those are both great recommendations. <laughs> I've written it down. <laughs> Do love preacher. So I'll stay on topic w- with the stuff I've been talking to uh, talking about. I think the Responsible Data Forum, I-, I think, is one of the best efforts out there to develop a sort of culture of essentially dialogue about data ethics and practices for data ethics and especially civic institutions. And I just see some of the clearest and most urgent thinking in the field coming out from the Responsible Data Forum. So I want to shove that up them out. I've been thinking a lot recently about data trust which is a a vehicle for governance that's being explored by Sean McDonald and Keith Porcaro at Digital uh, I think Digital Public is the name of their initiative. And uh, the, thir- the third version branches from that. So data trusts as, as a vehicle has not, have not been, um, it's been taken up at, at, at the site of Toronto's new project that Sidewalk Labs has been proposing. Um, there's now an ongoing conversation about how Toronto residents will be in potentially uh, a governing relationship with Sidewalk Labs, which is of an arm of Google, as they redevelop a huge part of the city. And um, I want to shout out Bianca Wiley's work at the Open Data Institute there in Toronto. She's just been doing just amazing work, drawing attention to the serious questions that I think have yet to be answered about how civic life will be preserved, how it will be governed in a world where mega platforms are making deals with governments to essentially reshape the way that we live. And I think that the, the conversations coming out of there are not only fascinating on their own front, but, but potentially um, illuminating for all of us who are trying to figure out how to build a better world in the face of very rapid change. So thank you all. Yeah, thank you all for having me on and giving me the opportunity to talk about all this stuff. Greg, and, thank you. It's been, it's been fantastic. Go ahead, Pia. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 that's all right. I think we, we, we just wanted to thank Greg for um, being around and for kind of translating uh, Ostrom's principle for the rest of us who find them inaccessible. So I appreciate that and the work you've also been doing in applying them to open source. I think there is an immense value in figuring out a framework that helps open source communities govern themselves. And I I am a firm believer that believer that the commons do not need to be tragic. So yeah, thanks, Greg. That's right. Well, thank you for all of your work. It's really uh, uh, it also blazes a path for for I think many of us. So thank thanks again for giving us the opportunity to learn alongside you. All right. Fantastic. On that note, we'll wrap it up. Thank you guys for being here, and we will see you next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.